was just telling young Brandon had them glass Gatorade bottles hit different. Come on, man. It was a whole different animal. You wasn't outside if you didn't have a glass Gatorade bottle. Man, that's where that's where <laughs> y'all y'all kids know them little plastic joints, man. Them glass ones. Woo! Mama was happy with you when you got when when she brought home the glass bottle. Can't lemon say I've lime, seen it. Orange. That's the one I remember. Lemon lime. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite. Yeah. Still is. Yeah. It's the ones that's in the commercial. Sometimes I dream. What's the uh what's the thing you, you don't you don't like uh Gatorade outside of sporting events? Well I yeah, no, I like I, drinking like a sport drink just like for fun is just weird to me. You mean for fun, for hydration. Like like yeah, it's, it's I, in my I fridge don't know. right now, D -Lo. Like so like yeah, I just I've never been able to just walk around, even those cocoa fives that I got. Those yeah. only work when I'm like, I've tried to like, I tried to bring them in here and drink them like that. Is just, this is to replenish <laughs> lost electrolytes. Like it doesn't work for me right now. It so doesn't you, quench my thirst. You didn't fully commit to the bit. You would have became Mike if it was an everyday drink. Mm. Well, see, when I was younger, I see? did. Okay. No, no. Well, you, well, point, both of y'all don't act like you know me. <laughs> when I was younger, I was drinking it every day uh -huh. and I still didn't become Mike. I drank Gatorade. I ate Wheaties. I, I ate McDonald's. I, I, I it was uh, it, you know what? It's probably because I couldn't afford the shoes. No. So what Mike should have said is, if you're poor, you can't be like Mike. No, th that's not what happened. You didn't have like the crossbar in your room, and then like, to hang myself hang, from. Yeah, no. that's that's where you messed up. I guess that is. Is it? Did it work? I don't know. I'm six six. <laughs> what do you say? The milkman was tall. <laughs> <laughs> Milkman was 6'6. Six, six. I always thought my mom had an affair too. My, my, my sister, my sister, my sister, who's got like, she's got darker hair, darker eyes. My grandma's got darker hair, darker eyes. I'm the one with a darker dad, and I look like I do. I was like, Mom, like, why don't, like, I think I first brought it up when I was like 20 something. I was like, let's have a real discussion right now. <laughs> so, will you tell me the truth? Does she do laugh at you? Probably, so I'm gonna get out of her face. It's get probably something face. along those lines. <laughs> this is the off season, Brandon. This is what happens. You asked how the off season is treating us. This is how conversations about bats happen. Is because of this right here. <laughs> it's all natural. Uh, our good buddy Brandon Nunez of the Kings Beat, the Kings Pulse, the Kings Herald, uh, joining us here. Uh, Brandon and I and and, and Kenny uh, uh, James Ham uh, went and grabbed the video of Sasha's injury. The first time we've mm -hmm. seen it, we saw a video of him leaving the court. Uh, but we did see Sasha's video for the first time. It's on ESPN 1320's Twitter account, James Ham's Twitter account, our Twitter account. Uh, if you're a Kings fan, you probably can find it relatively easy. It's a pretty awkward looking injury. Uh, he reacts right away. Mm. Uh, of course, make of that what you will. He's getting an MRI now. Um, uh, Brandon, I, I, I just it's, it's, it's hard to bring up Sasha without asking about the injuries. Obviously, we have no details. Uh, on the injury, but I know you've been watching a lot of uh, Sasha Vizenkov. If he's, I, I'll, I'll pose the first question like this: If, if be it injury reasons, financial reasons, or some other reasons, if he doesn't come over to play for Sacramento, is that a big loss for the Kings this off season? I think so. I mean, you can't count on him coming over. I'm sure that they have contingency plans in place if that doesn't end up working out. And and obviously hope hope the best for him just as an individual looking at that injury. It's hard to tell the severity, but needing help off the court is never a great sign. Um, and he's just a phenomenal player. I, I think that I got to talk to Chima Moneki a little bit about playing against Vezenkov. And they played against each other in the semifinals of the Euro League uh, playoffs. And one of the things Chima pointed out was just how efficient he is with his dribbles. You know, you're not seeing him dribble the air out the ball and do all these, all, all these off the dribble moves to kind of create space while everybody is just standing around. It's all within the flow of the offense. And they have one of the most beautiful offenses in the world outside of the NBA, extremely free flowing. And it's easy to see how that could translate to what Sacramento was running last year. I mean, just being so efficient within the flow like that, it, it's easy to see how that translates. So I, I think he's an extremely high IQ guy that would fit beautifully into the offense. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. Maybe I've just been watching a little too much, but like, I think this is a guy that occasionally could be closing games for you. If it works out, you know, obviously there's a role adjustment, there's a cultural adjustment and everything that comes with that. Um, but I, I think there's a lot there. 
So like, if I don't disagree with what he could bring to the table um, because I see a lot of the same things as well. But for it to be a big a loss for the Kings potentially, that would have to mean that the, the coaching staff and this, this front office was kind of relying on him coming over. And I don't, I don't think they were, Brendan. Like, you can tell me what you think about it, but I, I thought they looked at Sasha as a luxury, not a necessity. And, I, you know, if he came over here, that'd be great. If not, we still think we're, we're pretty good and we can, you know, find maybe that production elsewhere. But you seem to think that maybe they were relying on him coming over a little bit more than we realized. Yeah, I don't know about relying on him. It's more so that I've like talked to myself into if it works out that I, I think this is a good fit, that this would all translate to to NBA game. I, I think that just from the guys that they're sending out there, that obviously the Sacramento has some interest, but with it being a situation out of their control, like Sasha just has to want to do it. I'm sure that they're not relying on it. You know, like I, I think that Trey Lyles is a guy that plenty of people have talked about, like, oh, what would Sasha coming over mean for Trey? Is there a little bit of redundancy there? Would you rather spend your money elsewhere if you have Sasha? Um, and I will say Trey really tugged at my heartstrings in his in his exit interview. So as a person, I'm really hoping Trey returns to sack. But from a front office standpoint, it, it could make sense to go a different direction. But you could also pitch that as if Sasha doesn't work out, you still have Trey sitting there who who clearly wants to come back. Do you do you think that they're repetitive? Do you think they're redundant, the two players? I do. Um, and that's primarily because, like, I don't think that Trey Lyles is your long-term answer at backup five. I think that that was a creative way to make things work last year. But ideally, you can get a guy that, that can be a rim protector. I still think that's something that's really important for this team or a guy that can switch on five. But I think that as much as Trey helped you offensively at the five – that he's better suited at the four because if you want to get better defensively, you kind of got to do that at the five in my mind. Hmm. So that leads to the question. You want Dwight Howard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually don't hate it. I, I know that uh, everybody's running with it right now because of what Dwight said. And Dwight's saying a lot of stuff, to be fair. He's, he's well, hilarious right now. Yeah, I guess that's a, it goes without being said, huh? But I mean, I think that's the, Interesting type of guy. If he could still move his feet, could still get decent timing on on blocking shots and not foul too much. I really liked what he sort of molded himself into as a role player when he when he played with the Lakers. So that actually is somebody that's that's pretty intriguing to me. He gets it. Like I think he understands his role too. Like I think his, his phrasing. Obviously, he was talking to Mark Haynes, who is you know in Sacramento, which is part of why the Kings came up. But it's you know, he talked about helping with like, he's, he's aware, he's not Orlando Dwight. Like he's not defensive player of the year, you know, four times over Dwight Howard. He, he's a guy who can help a team and Sacramento. How much did we scream about the backup five last year? We brought up DeMarcus last year. We, 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 we brought up Dwight. Mm -hmm. Like, like you telling me like, yes, we're begging for Mason Plumley, and we could go get one of these guys to just yeah. come in and help. Right. And, we given we given something up to go get Mason Humley when we could just bring in well we couldn't bring in Dwight last year but you can bring him in now yeah um and it's still as you mentioned there Brendan that that backup five is still such a position to need yeah it's something that needs to be figured out I don't think that bringing back Mezzi or Alex Lynn is the answer I don't think Trey Lyles is your answer at the backup five um I, I think some semblance of rim protection and it's kind of why like. Bryant West has been able to talk me to the idea of like Trace Jackson da Davis, even at 24. And I don't know that I love spending 24 on a backup mm -hmm. five or a guy that like, you know, hypothetically could maybe steal some minutes next to Domas at the four. Um, but really figuring out that backup five, uh, I'm sure as you guys remember, like that was very much a talking point for good reason. It was like the second the Domas isn't out there, they were playing with different guys. You can tell when Mike Brown is searching. It was one of the most obvious things ever this year when he's just trying everybody. I swear you could see him go look at the bench and just kind of stare down the line of like, huh, who are we going to try it right now? <laughs> and you need you need an answer at that back of five. Very he did. I feel like that was one of the nights he put Rashawn in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt like Rashawn. Me? Or Del Delhi and Keon in the first half. Oh, that was <laughs> yeah. oh, that was an experience. <laughs> there were some lineup moves for Mike this year that were definitely an experience. I still think that was a little overblown. 
Which it still one? is the whole backup five thing. Yeah. I mean, it it's not wrong though. It didn't cost him anything. And then once he committed, once once he's and this guy he has his own issues, but once he committed to just going back to Metu more times than not, they played fine. They played fine. So I guess my my issue with it was trying to give up something to get a backup five. Now you don't have to do that. You can either draft somebody or you can sign a free agent and it doesn't cost you a second rounder or, you know, anything like that. So I, I think that was more of my issue back in the season when it was, when it was being brought up uh, at nauseum, but um, yeah, you can just go get a Dwight at this point, or you can uh, go get boogie or, you know, the random player that's still in the league X and get them to be your, your, your backup five option. Or maybe Rashawn Holmes remembers how to play basketball. Or maybe Rashawn Holmes. There's yep. that. Yep. <laughs> uh, this, um, I don't want to butcher this individual's name, but they responded to James's video of Sasha Vazenkov. Uh, bone bruise on the back of the surface of the medial, tibial, mm. something of the right knee. Mm. He is questionable for Sunday's game. It's going to be difficult to play. Uh, this person is a... Uh, he he works for one of the look, looks like papers or websites out there, but this is what he does. He covers the league uh, out there. He is the Brandon Nunez of uh, <laughs> Olympiacos. Um, but yeah, that's 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 what we got right now. Bone bruise on the back of the surface of some particular part of the right knee. He's questionable for Sunday's game. Uh, he also notes it's going to be difficult for him to play with this injury. Wow. So that's the update on Sasha Vazenkov. Bone bruise could be worse. Um, questionable is encouraging, although notable it is the finals for a Greek mm-hmm. basket league. So I'm sure that even if he was feeling horrible, I'd imagine it'd still be questionable and he's going to do everything he can to be out there, um, mm-hmm. especially with the season that they've already had and just be an MVP and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, could be worse news. Yeah, you kind of, I, I I don't know. I you're You're one of the... I think you're the first person, Brendan, and I know how much you've been watching him lately. I think you're the first person who really is like all in on Sasha. And the and, and it's interesting to hear you say that because you know, because you talk about it would be because the, the question that started our conversation was would it be a loss if either Sasha's hurt or doesn't come over for Sacramento and you think that it will be. And one thing that I just kept getting hung up on when talking about Sasha was so many people went over to see him like Mm -hmm. Matina from the office, Mike Brown, the coaching staff, Jordy Fernandez, like so many people went over to see him. I just kept getting hung up on. They wouldn't do that if they didn't think it was important. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so in hearing you, the way uh, you talk, hearing the way you talked about him, man, I'm, 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 I might be singing a different tune on Sasha here. Mm. I mean, I think he's more important to this process than I than I originally gave him credit for. I just think the the best player far and away on what on a team that really has an argument for being the best non NBA team in the world um, mm-hmm. is saying a lot. You know, Euro League MVP is no easy feat. Led the league seventeen point six points a game, and you got to keep in mind this is forty minute games rather than forty eight, so numbers go down a little bit. Um, but 65% from two when he's being guarded, like an MVP is being guarded in 37, almost 38% from three on like five attempts a game. Um, I think it's smooth. I think it's smart, you know, like Euro league MVPs, some other guys that I think are somewhat similar games are like a Miritich or, or be Elisa. And obviously these guys are going to have their deep differences. He's obviously not a Luka Doncic um, with Luka being so young when he did it, but think of how important be Elisa was and, and just how, I think that people can really, when you think back on Bielitsa, focus on the shooting, but he could really put the ball on the floor and make decisions and was an extremely smart player. And I I think that Sasha fits that same mold. You know what I like um, about Brendan's explanation as to why it would be a good reason to have him over here is he says and he believes that he could finish games. And that was one of my things when people were going crazy over the back of five. I was like, yeah, it's cool, but last seven minutes of the game, you're not even going to play. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but th- w- what are we giving up so much for for a guy that's not even going to 
being there at the end of the game. And when you look at somebody like Sasha, he is a guy that potentially, depending on how he's playing that night or the matchups or whatever, can be a guy that can finish games. And that that's something that speaks to me. That's something I'm like, all right, well, now, now you got a, a, a game time closer in there. And, and you know, if they can find a way to, to still bring him over if everything's okay with him. Um, I do think he can help this team for sure. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much of a negative it is if he weren't to be on this team next year, but I do think if he is there, he can definitely help. There's obviously still defensive question marks with Sasha the same way, like with that to he still ride right that the elites a comp. Right. Yeah. He uh, fits right in. <laughs> right. Um, and, and he also fits right in with being the really high IQ free flow and offensive guy. Um, so I, I think there's games where maybe he obviously won't be able to do that because of defensive shortcomings. Like you would see certain teams try to get him onto switches and Olympiacos allowed that a little bit, like saw him on like guys like, um, like Shane Larkin and Carson Edwards, Tyler Dorsey. And it, it's kind of mixed results, but I think if he can follow the defensive game plans of allowing nobody middle and just sort of, uh, give more effort on that end as he's asked to do a little bit less on offense. I just think there's going to be nights. I don't think he's in the closing lineup every night or anything. I just think there's going to be nights where he's on offensively and you want to keep him out there as long as you feel okay with Keegan being the guy there guarding the, the other wing, the primary wing on the other side. Yeah. That's Celtics legend, Carson Edwards. <laughs> um, going away from Sasha here and looking at the, the, the rest of the roster, the, particularly the the part of the roster that might be changing. You've already brought up, you know, Trey Lyles, Chemezi Metu. Um, we haven't talked about guys like Kessler Edwards yet. How do you think with free agency beginning, you know, about about f- f- four weeks from, from now, about four weeks from Friday, how do you think this shapes out? There's clearly going to be turnover uh, for Sacramento. Uh, who's vital to this team coming back? Like, who isn't? Um, you know, Kessler Edwards is under contract. You want to see him get a shot guys like Keon Ellis, like what kind of that, that, that second, that, that back part of the roster, like, like, what do you, what do you think about that group heading into next season? I think it's interesting. Um, Terrence Davis is, is a guy that obviously we saw coach Brown be really hard on, but I think in a constructive way, I think TD took that well. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if he saw an opportunity, a larger role somewhere else. Um, and TD is not a guy that I'm necessarily looking at is like, okay, I want to keep him around for sure. I, I think that he's a nice luxury to have when maybe you have some, some guys not showing up at the start of your guard rotation guard sort of wing rotation and want to go there. But I don't think TD is a ne- necessity or anything. Um, Alex Len, I'm good with moving in a different direction. Personally, I, I think that, um, while he showed some things, especially in the playoffs. And I was surprised they waited so long to actually throw him out there that, you know, the, he moves well for his size, but I still think ideally somebody that can run the, keep up with the pace that Sacramento runs a little bit more. And if you're going to commit to a guy like that, that's primarily a rim defender, I, I would just want him to be a little bit better at that specific skill. Um, Della Vadova, I don't know how much game he really has left, to be honest. I think if you can get a third string, point guard there that that maybe you looked at but it's nothing crazy right um maybe he transitions to coaching that idea has been floated yeah, around he's right in, you're playing in australia yeah, I think oh that's playing. right that's yeah. right um and then mezzi i i think that mezzi's really intriguing i would like to see mezzi personally get an opportunity on one of these teams that is kind of in the earlier stages and let him get a little bit more of an expanded role and an opportunity like to spread his wings a little bit something like that you okay. know um, where I think they can just give him a little bit more freedom to go through the learning process. Cause I think there's a lot there. There's a lot of raw talent, but it kind of needs to be refined. And I think that's through the process of getting those reps. Um, so I, I really think that retool and a lot of the back end here would, would make sense. And I don't think you're talking about crazy names you're bringing in or anything, but I think guys that can just provide a little bit more on the defensive end. And it's a really careful balance. Cause I'm a big, um, I, I really, and big on not trying so hard to lose to cover up your strengths that you lose, excuse me, to cover up your defenses that you lose your strengths in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that you need to bring in guys that can get it done defensively, but still play that same free flowing. It's just being, I think a high IQ quick processing speed offensively that allows you to play in this offense. So 
there's nobody at this back end to me where it's like, okay, I really want to keep this guy around. Trey Lyles might be the closest thing if if Sasha doesn't come over. We can't g- get a consensus on that point, like because <laughs> we talk about that all we talk about that all of the time. The the defensive shortcomings and the really really good offense. Mm-hmm. Are you willing to sack? Like what you you're almost certainly going to have to sacrifice one. Mm-hmm. Which one are you willing to sacrifice? And we saw how far the offense got them this year. And now it's like, okay, can you can you tool up the defense a little bit? Like we're doing this with draft picks now. Mm-hmm. Oh, this draft pick is good defensive. But they, they can't score. Mm-hmm. Oh, this draft pick can score, but they're not good defensively. And we can't. We just keep we keep getting torn into this same battle of. Of of the line you just met, uh, uh, trying to cover up your, your your weaknesses but messing up your strengths. Yeah, and I, I think like you can look at Denver. I, that was a team to me, and obviously they're just an ideally built team. It's hard to specifically model that, but they were a team to me that I was unsure if they were ever going to be good enough defensively. But then you just bring in a an Aaron Gordon, which is a wing spot that the Sacramento Kings are missing right now. They have a hole, and. Then you bring in just a little guy, a guy like a Bruce Brown, or and then you draft like Christian Brown, you know, and, and these other guys around there, still your main core, they just kind of had to step it up. Jokic got better as a defender. He he lost some weight. He's able to keep up, move his feet better with these guys. Jamal Murray was great defensively, I thought, in game three. You saw that effort that he got out there. So um and, and Michael Porter Jr. does fine for his size. He had a couple of slip ups, specifically game one and game two. I thought he was better in game three, but like you need jumps. From I think the biggest way you get better defensively is really jumps from De'Aaron, Domas, Keegan, and, and then whatever that last wing is going to be. You know, that's a guy that I, I was thinking about earlier, and, and we've kind of mentioned it a little bit, but Bruce Brown, you know, as somebody that maybe you overpay for. He's got a player option with Denver. He's scheduled, I think, if I'm a reading 6. this right. 5? Yeah. 6.8. Bruce Brown, let's double that. I'll give you $12 million a year over three years. Damn, just throwing Uncle V's money around. <laughs> <laughs> He's 26 years old, going to mm. be 27 by the time the season starts. Mm. I like Bruce Brown's game a lot, like a lot. And I'd say, hey, you get a starting small forward spot uh, here in Sacramento for $12 million a year. I mean, I, I think he'd be a great get. I think the big like complication between building the – the nuggets surrounding pieces in Sacramento is, is that like Jamal Murray and Jokic are great shooters and De'Aaron and Domas obviously have question marks in that aspect. And that's where it gets so hard. Like, could you even plug in Aaron Gordon to play next to De'Aaron and Domas? Or does that mess up your offense too much? Kind of to our point. And I think Bruce Brown fits the same question. It almost like applies to what we saw in my mind with Davion Mitchell this year. Like, I think that he really could have helped you defensively, but you're losing a lot on offense for what you throw out there because a lot of it has to do with your two main stars are not shooters. It like really puts you in a weird spot where how are you going to find these defenders? But you also have this caveat, uh, possibly have this caveat of they have to be shooters because our stars aren't. Uh, Brendan, you brought up Keegan a few moments ago. What do you want to see Keegan improve on the most next season? Yeah, I think it's finishing at the rim for me. You know, he, he finished at an okay rate. When he got there, I think he had something, I think he was like 42 or 48 on dunks this year. But I just remember when he first got drafted and Monty McNair had his availability after the draft concluded that one of the things he really highlighted was Keegan's dunk percentage in college. That, you know, he's not throwing it down on people's heads, but just putting two hands on the rim and pushing the ball down. It's the most efficient shot in basketball. And I felt like Keegan, in my mind, it's because of an adjustment to physicality. That's just what I'm presuming was going on this year, which I think is a typical adjustment for rookies. But I thought there were opportunities where he could have thrown it down and just didn't. You know, Coach Brown had his quote this year of don't give cats in this league respect they don't deserve when talking to Keegan about going and throwing it down on someone. So I'd like to see him take that jump. It was 63% of the rim. I think that's fine, but it could be better for a guy his size. So that's that's the one specific thing that stands out to me. But obviously, if you get some off-the-dribble stuff, that's where we're talking about a completely different Keegan. Do you think he's he's kind of capable capable of some off the dribble stuff? Sometimes earlier in the season, I wondered, but I think maybe maybe that had to do with the learning curve of being a rookie in this league. And because earlier in his career, in his 
rookie season and even in the off season, people were trying to say Chris Middleton. I was like, you guys are crazy. He is not Chris Middleton can handle the rock. He can create off the bounce. No, Keegan can't do that. And as the season went along, he didn't do it a lot, but there were times when I saw him handle the rock within the offense. And I said, Oh, I, I kind of see where it could be there. I don't know if he can get all the way to that Chris Middleton level, but do you think he's pop, uh, capable of that? I, I think if you put together a highlight reel of the off the dribble stuff, you'd be like, okay, this is this is some serious stuff. But it's just it was just so rare last mm-hmm. year, right? He had thirty five pull up threes compared to four hundred and sixty five off the catch, right? He had forty nine pull up two point attempts, like. He, he was hardly doing that. And maybe that's not one to step on people's toes, just getting the feel of the NBA and his role and this team and everything going on. Um, but I, I do think that there were flashes. I certainly have more optimism about his ceiling after year one than I did when he was initially drafted. So I, I think there's something there. I do think he needs to clean up the handle, even if he, uh, you know, told coach and staff that the handle's already there, that, I think mm-hmm. developing that is kind of the difference that you're talking about, Kenny, with the Chris Middleton comp. And I roll my eyes a little bit of Chris Middleton comps now because I swear I see them on every single prospect that's like not projected to be a star. But it's like, oh, nobody could be a perfect number two. Um, but Keegan said Chris was a guy himself that he looked at when he first got over to SAC. So I think there's some stuff there. It was just on such small sample size. So maybe the way to try to unlock that is just the coaching staff enabling him to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have a favorite in the draft uh, so far? I Right now I'm writing a po- profile on uh, Bilal Koulibaly, who I do not think is going to be there. There's been a lot of hype around him right now, but I do absolutely love the upside there. Um, a guy that I've really come around to, I think, is is Colby Jones, who doesn't have great size. Um, he's from Xavier, but a guy that does a little bit of everything well. Only, almost reminds me of like, Dante DiVincenzo-esque, and I know he was somewhat polarizing, but I was a guy that really liked Dante. Um, And I do somewhat lean towards if you feel like there's a guy at this spot available, if you can get a guy that can contribute right now, I lean that way a little bit, even though there's some upside swings that I certainly wouldn't be mad about. What you talking about? What you, what you talking about, Joe Madruski? What, what, you, what you talking about? You talking about Amani Bates? That's what you talking about? You talking I don't about know about Amani? that one, Kenny. Maybe, maybe oh. we're talking 54. Maybe at 54, 24. I don't know. Come on, man. He got Brian, he, Kenny got Bryant West on his side yesterday. And thought, I'm going to give me <laughs> Brandon Nunez. We're going to form this little Bates army right here. Bates army. Yeah, I'm not quite there yet. But I will say, you know, I wasn't with you on Shaden Sharp and I look like an idiot right now. So you don't look like an idiot. Do you, do you have a, do you have a, uh, he can. Do you have a, that, that risk guy? Do you have that, that, that big swing guy? I really like uh, C.D. Sissoko, the G League guy. I really, I mean, I like all three G League guys, obviously Scoot and Leonard Miller, but uh, C.D. Sissoko, I think, is somebody that's really interesting. There's times where he impresses you more than Leonard Miller throughout the course of a game, but he's got a lot of physicality um, and some interesting playmaking that's there, but just would take a little bit of time. And then two other ones that stand out, uh, Max Lewis, really interesting to me. I think the shot creation from Pepperdine um, is is intriguing. There's like stuff where you're like, man, this guy could be a big time scorer in the league possibly, but defensive question marks make me hesitate a little bit. Um, and I think I had one more, but I'm drawing a blank here. So that's all our Julian Phillips, <laughs> Julian Phillips from Tennessee, lengthy okay. athletic broke some, some records at the combine for athleticism, good length defender. Um, yeah, there's gonna be some some options for sure. Go rock the top. I, I, I wanna I wanna swing for the fence though. I don't I really don't care where it's you at. You always 24. wanna swing for the you wanted <laughs> last year. Yeah. Did we take one? Not really. No, you wanted Shaden. Well, yeah, I did want Shaden. I love Keegan though. Keegan worked out just fine. He did. Worked out just fine. But they you're always take, swinging at something. I gotta swing till I hit. Well, they didn't even swing last year. They got Keegan Murray, <laughs> which was a fine draft pick. It just it was it is it's not the the high risk pick in, that you're looking in, for. Uh, you're a gambler. You, you wouldn't well, you wouldn't know this because you don't play video games, but MLB the show, you can swing with power or you can swing with contact. When you swing with power, you may hit a home run, but your your window is smaller. When you swing with contact, maybe you're not swinging with all that power, but your window to hit the ball is is a lot bigger. They swung with contact last year, got a nice little 
Nice little double. I'd say that's a double. That's not even a single. I used to just hit B in the bat with swing. I don't know what the hell you're talking I, about. I don't even have numbers anymore. Kenny, so. Kenny's contact button clearly doesn't work. I don't, they, I don't. They, don't, they don't have any numbers. I ain't any letters anymore, sir. Are you a it's video game shapes. guy? I am a video game guy, actually. Do you play the show? A little bit. I, I like tried recently because I hate 2K, and I hate that I hate 2K because I used to love it. So mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to try all these other sport games, and the show is one of the better ones. The show is the best. What's your is your favorite out. FIFA? It feels like yes, everyone's easily. favorite. Easily. I love FIFA. I, I love I FIFA. FIFA last night. I'm trying to figure out how to make it to an inner Miami game. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, there, <laughs> there you go. Uh, you're a Celtics guy. Is that not related to the Kings? Are you are you ready to break up Jalen and and uh Jason? No Taylor? way. No shot. Like, come on. These guys are so young and you know, I, I've heard some people say, well, like, oh, their their ceiling's clearly the conference finals. I'm like, well, they just got to the finals last year. And if you're getting consistently to the conference finals, you're right there. Why is that a bad thing? I, I get putting six hundred million into two mm. guys for the next five mm. years. That number's freaking insane. Um, but we're dealing with bigger numbers now, slowly yep. and slowly. Yep. And that's an amazing duo. You're able to you. you're clearly good enough to get to the chip and win it. So like, I, I just don't, I don't think they should break it up. I think they're unbalanced. I don't think it works with those two. As well, you as also as hate Marcus should. smart, a playmaking point guard. Would help. I think Marcus smart is a shooting guard, not a point guard. And he's playing out of position. I even think that would open things up for smart too. If you traded Jalen for a center or a power forward or something like that, that would open up Marcus smarts game too. Well, I don't think you're getting Chris Paul. I mean, Chris Paul's going to L.A. Yeah. Or Phoenix, I guess, if you read no everything clue. people were writing this morning. He's going to L.A. I think so, too. Yeah. It's that but is it the Lakers or the Clippers? Lakers. Clippers reunion would be kind of cool. Where does he have the better shot at winning? Can you say that, like, definitively? No, you can't say definitively. I think both of them are about the same. I think Clippers. If Paul, well, close. Paul George and Kawhi Clippers. Leonard, if you could rely on them staying healthy, right. then yeah, but you can't. Well, is the same true for Anthony Davis? Like, yeah. does LeBron have to do it by himself at 39 freaking years old? Well, it's the same question, right? Yeah. And now, like, LeBron gets dinged up a little bit, which isn't something that happened. But if you're, if you're Chris Paul, if you're Chris Paul, would you rather play with Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and whoever else they got on that team? I know they got other guys, but mm -hmm. like whoever, or LeBron, AD, Austin Reeves. I think uh, Ty Lue and Darvin Ham play a part in this too. Yeah, I still think it's the Clippers, but I think there's also the, this will finally dead the Chris Paul Lakers story. <laughs> Cause that's like a part of his legacy now, not to any fault of his own. It doesn't really have anything to do right, with him. Right. But that's forever going to be a part of his legacy. If you could, you never got to play with Kobe, but you you get this moment with your boy LeBron. Mm -hmm. I actually think, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't Chris Paul on the banana boat? Yeah, he's a yeah. banana boat guy. Gotta yeah. bring Melo back. Chris Paul was on the banana bring boat. Melo back. He finally, well, it's too late. He already made his <laughs> video. Can't people, bring him back. He already the, made his the, video. the people love Melo too. All the players and everybody. All the tributes and posts oh yeah people love them. it was only the james hams that didn't like <laughs> damn james ham and his carmelo hate uh brandon you know we rock with you man we appreciate you so much uh anybody who uh, wants great great king's coverage should hire brandon nunez to cover this team man, he's, he's he's as good as it gets uh we appreciate you my friend thanks for carving out some time for us always glad to do it guys appreciate you <laughs>